Well, good morning to all, and welcome to the College Church here on September 12. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, is it not? It truly is. The Lord is at work, and you can see that uh, some things are happening outside. Haven't you noticed? So some construction equipment's on the site, and the scaffolding, and the safety equipment's put, put in place. And I want to just touch on that very briefly. So we've crossed sort of a threshold in our fundraising for the roof project, and we have total cash on hand, $104,000. $351.75. I think that's an amen right there. And 16, almost 17,000 in pledges for, the, for this year and more for next year and the following. And recently our loan for 100,000 was approved. <clears throat> so that's all in the works. So this is happening, my friends. And, uh, you know, I hope that as we come to church, we, or, or maybe you drive by at the church during the week, there's a very, very visible reminder about this is happening. So keep this in your prayers and in your stewardship planning. Um, pray also for the construction crew that is here. You know, I'm sure many of the people who will be working on this project have no connection with our church. And perhaps serendipitously, a connection will be made. I mean, you never know how this can work because God is in control and we never know. So, um, you know, as people come and go, you know, maybe we would start talking. I know they're going to be busy. They're not going to be able to sit around and talk for an hour about the Bible, you know, about their lives. But maybe make a connection. You never know where this will go. Um, so keep in your prayers and your planning. And, of course, we pray for each and every uh, worker and for their safety as well. Because it is kind of high up there. It is kind of high. So um, that's, I want to bring that to our attention also. We're seriously and almost ready to jump off the, into the, in the deep end of the pool about an outreach ministry. And what we're trying to do is to possibly form a handbell choir, a socially distant handbell choir. And we have the bells, and uh, this would be an outreach as well as an inreach. So the idea would be to have our members, but also people from the community to be part of this. And I'm saying this because right about now, everybody's starting to feel isolation fatigue. You know, being sequestered, separated, they've lost their social structure, friends and connection at work, and, and I'm hoping that this will be a, a, an opportunity and a venue for people to, you know, connect with people and human beings. So if you have an interest in that, let, uh, let Ilana know or myself. And, uh, um, you know, and maybe it's something that you could talk to your neighbor and say, hey, we're starting a handbell choir. It's going to be a couple of sessions of training. And then we're going to have probably two uh, performances on during our worship service. So it may be something so you could say, talk to your neighbor. Hey, you want to join me? Let's go. Let's do this. And, and uh, um, you know, Bring them, invite them to the church through that way. Um, there's a bunch of announcements in the bulletin. Uh, the nominating committee is meeting very regularly, and I'm asking that all of us prayerfully consider uh, the ministries that God may have called you to be involved in. So please pray for that, and uh, may the Lord uh, lead and guide that committee. I want to just again highlight our prayer meeting. We're having a wonderful time on Zoom, and our discussion last evening on the uh, on Zoom with the uh, last day events series with uh, led by um, oh, just forgot her name. Any anyway, rate, Kayla, Kayla was uh, very very meaningful to connect with each other. So why don't we bow our heads for prayer as we begin our worship service? Father in heaven. Lord, it is good to be here to get it today. And Lord, we want to thank you for the privilege of being here and of being your sons and daughters. Lord, we pray that we will always remember the price you've paid for us and how dearly you love us and how deeply you love us. And may that truth be permanently rooted in our hearts 
and may it indeed propel everything we do and how we live and why we live. Lord, we pray that as we worship you, may we do so from the depths and the bottom of our hearts where there is a true love, appreciation, and joy in knowing you. In Jesus' saving name we pray, amen. Today's call to worship is found in Psalms 107, 1 to 9. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those he redeemed from the hands of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east, from west, from north, from south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love, for his wonderful deeds for men, for he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. The scripture reading for today is found in Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 to 18, and I will be reading from NIV translation, Daniel 3, 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abnego reply to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hands. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. 
it's time for us to pray right now and we can just sit where you are and just bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, it is with humility and praise that I bow before you today. I am, humbly, I am humbled by the evidence of your work in my life and the lives of those around me. Thank you for your love and care for those of us worshiping today. Thank you for recognizing us all as unique individuals. Thank you for the blessings of this past week amidst the conflict also taking place in this world. Lord, I thank you that we are able to start the building project here at the church this past week. I ask your blessing on every part of this project. Please bless those who have donated or who have made pledges to make this possible. Help the workers who have been hired to be efficient in all that they do. And may the job be done with skill and craftsmanship that will last for years to come. Help this church building's leaking roof issues to be resolved in the best ways possible. At this time of year, that brings a new beginning for teachers, professors, and students. I pray for our teachers at South Lancaster Academy and other institutions of learning. Give them wisdom during these difficult times. Bless the students of these institutions of these instructors, and may they have the ability to focus on what they need to learn and do. Be also with our Sabbath school teachers for both the children and the adults. Lastly, Lord, I pray for those with health concerns, for those who may be confined to their homes or in long-term care facilities, and for those who may be unemployed. Help them to know they are not alone, and may they not become discouraged. Help them to find useful ways to feel fulfilled. May they feel your presence and help those of us here today to be led by your spirit so we can know how to best support those who may be lonely or sad. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. This is Archibald. Archie's one of my roosters. Isn't he handsome? No, I'm not here to cook. I'm wearing an apron to protect my dress. <laughs> That's why we wear them when we cook too, so. Um, so Archie is, as you can tell, a pretty chill rooster. He's pretty calm, isn't he? Now, I can open up his cage and he'll come out and wander around in my barn. And sometimes he goes through the little fence and he wanders around in the barnyard. And Liberty, my livestock guardian dog, will not pay any attention to him. And he's like, cool. So he goes and he does his little dust bath thing in the dust and the dirt, because that's how they, they bathe. And, um, and he wanders around and he pecks and scratches and eats. And if I don't put him back in his cage in time for bed, he goes and sits under my milking stand or one of my wagons. And when I get out in the barn and see him there, I say, come on, Archie, it's time to go to bed. And he comes walking out, lets me pick him up, pick him up and take him and put him back in his cage. Pretty cool, huh? Now, Archie wasn't always this way. He used to run like crazy to get away from me. Now, come on, am I really that scary? So he used to run to get away. Don't snag my nut on. I have a guy. There you go. 
So um, until he got sick, and then he had no choice but to let me catch him. And then I put him in a cage, and I tended him every day, and I took care of him, and I helped him get better, and he learned how to trust me. I have, you might be able to hear, I have a couple other things too. Archie, why don't you sit next to me? We'll check the platform here. Okay, ready? Here's your big guy. Here. Yeah, stay. <laughs> I'm not sure he's that well trained, but stay. <laughs> no. No, but I do have a couple of friends whose middle name is Archibald, <laughs> and that was the inspiration. So I also have here two little babies. These are, here, let me hold it up for, you can't really see a whole lot. They're like, don't tip it. So these are two babies. Now these guys are not nearly as chill as Archie. They're afraid of anything new and different. <laughs> Through the microphone it echoes. But they're like, oh, what are you doing? But if I keep working with them and petting them while they're little, when they get big, they'll be chill like Archie. Pretty cool, huh? Now, for those of you kids who are watching and listening, today the pastor is going to talk about three guys named, if I can remember this, their, their original names. <laughs> yeah, that's the hard one. Hananiah, Mishael, and Ahazariah. And they started out, they lived in Judah. And one day, the king of Babylon decided he wanted some of Judah's kids, Judah's young men, handsome, smart young men, to go to Babylon, because he wanted things to be good between Babylon and Judah. So he took them, and they went. And you might recognize someone else that went with them. His name was Daniel. And we hear a lot about Daniel, especially with the lions. But this isn't about Daniel. This is about Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And, no, you have to stay. Okay, stay there. And they went and lived in Babylon. And the king said, ooh, I want you to eat all this fancy food. And Ahazariah and Hananiah and Mishael said, you know, we were taught what was good for us, so we want to keep eating what's good for us. Their parents raised them up. They worked with them and helped them not be afraid to follow God's, God's commands, God's the things that make a relationship with God good. And so they obeyed when they were little. And so when they got bigger and were asked to eat things that they knew weren't really good for them, they said, no, thank you. And then even later, when the king said, I want you to bow down to me, to my image. This is a statue of me. I want you to bow down to my image. They said, oh, no, thank you. And the king said, if you don't, I'm going to put you in the fiery furnace. And they still said, no, thank you. Now, was that very easy for them? I'm sure it was not. They had to have been scared just like these little chicks are scared of just about everything now. But they had practiced. They practiced obeying God, and they trusted God 
They knew that he would take care of them, just like Archie knows that I'm going to take care of him and not going to hurt him. So when I asked him to come out of his cage this morning and go into another cage and make the drive here, he was like, okay, I don't know what's going on, but okay. Because he trusted me. And when we, okay, okay, hush. When we trust God, when, when we know God and we practice trusting God, then even if it's little things, when the big things come, like you're going to be thrown in a fiery furnace if you don't do what I say, if that's against God, he will take care of us. And if you'll notice in the scripture, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are the same people as Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They just got new names. Okay. Oh, hang on there, buddy. They, I lost my train of thought. If you'll notice, they didn't say, oh, God will save us. They said, God can save us, and if he chooses not to, it's still okay. So he doesn't promise everything's going to be super duper all right all the time, but you know what? He's always got you in his hands, and he will take care of you, just like I take care of Archie, and he trusts me. So be like Archie. I wanted to mention two things here. Number one, if you're viewing online, there will be a short video of what we saw outside here for those who are viewing online. And if you want to see it again, you can go home and watch it eventually online. Uh, secondly, I wanted to mention that, uh, you know, uh, Michelle, next time somebody calls you chicken or me chicken, say, I'm being like Archie. I'm being like Archie. So thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, that was a wonderful visual demonstration there. Um, well, let's pray together as we begin. Father in heaven, 
Lord, it is good to be here today, and Lord, we want to pray that as we open up the Word of God, that you'll continue to be with us. We pray, Lord, that as you have spoken to us through the red word, through prayer, through, of course, uh, the children's story, we pray you'll continue to do that. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with our church family online. Bless them in a special way and be with them. And we look forward to the day when we are together again and we can see each other's smiles and shake hands and look into each other's eyes. Lord, till that day, be with us as we enjoy this moment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It was 1938, and it was in Russia. And the district party had a meeting, a committee meeting, where all the people were to attend and, and uh, have a meeting about how things were going to run in the USSR. Well, the meeting was drawn to a close, and the district committee leader uh, wanted to give a special, how should we say it, an, an applause or adoration for Stalin. So at the call of his name, everybody in that auditorium stood up and spontaneously began applauding, raising their hands. And this went on for a minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. And by now, think about this, you're holding your hands up, you're applauding. Five minutes, things are starting to get hurt. This is not a natural thing to do. And the, but the question was, who will be the first person to stop clapping? Who would be the first person? Well, there was the leader of the group, but the problem was as he was a newcomer and he replaced the guy who had been removed and sent into exile, arrested. So he wasn't about to stop clapping because you don't want to defame uh, or insult Stalin's name. So this literally went on for 10 minutes. 11 minutes, 12 minutes, till one person, the local paper factory uh, man, a uh, director, was a bit strong-minded, independent, you could say. And finally, he just stopped and he sat down in his chair and instantly everybody else followed suit. And it was like it was a deafening silence. Well, here's the problem. This is how the secret police discovered who the independent thinkers were, who the non-conformers were, and would eliminate them. And that very night, that man who was the director of the paper factory was arrested and given 10 years in a prison for some trumped up charges, things he had never done. As they're filling out the paperwork, uh, Form 206, the interrogator tells him, don't ever be the first to stop applauding. Ten years for being a nonconformist. It reminds me of a story that comes to us 2,600 years ago. A story about three, actually four, nonconformists. Turn with me in your Bible to Daniel chapter 3. The scene is Iraq, specifically Kirkuk. And yesterday, when I was online searching this out, I found out that yesterday's temperature was only 105 degrees there in Iraq. But here's the problem. As Michelle had mentioned earlier, the, 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 Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their bodies were in Babylon, but their hearts were in Jerusalem. And the four had discovered that reality of life that so often life pushes you in situation and places you really didn't intend to be years ago. Now, as we look at Daniel chapter 3, we're going to realize that the enemy really isn't a suicide bomber, an invisible virus. The enemy is ego. The enemy is pride. So in Daniel chapter 3, verse 1, we read these words, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Her shoe size, my friend, is 879. 
She weighs 62,000 pounds. Her index finger is eight feet long. Who am I talking about? The Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty from the feet to the crown is 111 feet. Daniel's or, or Nebuchadnezzar's image stands at 90 feet tall. So it gives you some perspective of how big this image was. And the purpose was, was obviously to intimidate people as they looked at its height. It was to dazzle people as they saw the gleaming gold it was covered with. And of course, it was designed to be bold and intimidating. Here was this image. What are we going to do with it? And probably, probably, uh, it, it looked either like the god Nebu, after which Nebuchadnezzar is named, or it suspiciously looked like Nebuchadnezzar. Either way, Prophets and Kings, page 506, offers an interesting insight. She said it was an idolatrous symbol of human power. An idolatrous symbol of human power. Now, verses 2, 3, and 4 tells us the guest list. It's a list of who's who and, and the VIPs, we could say. And then verses 4 through 6 tells us about the dedication or the service and what was to happen. Now, when you read through this carefully, you'll discover there's a shift in, in the purpose of this meeting, this assembly. In verse 2, it's very clear it's a dedication service. In verse 5, it's a worship service. Many of our life experiences, my friends, did not begin the way we intended them or, or, or the way they ended up. There's sort of a metamorphosis that goes on, and, and we find ourselves in situations and places we never, ever thought we would be in. Now, this can be a positive thing or a negative thing. New York Yankees, Phil Rosuto tells a story about one of the managers of the New York Yankees, and years ago, the schedule was a bit more demanding than it is now. Now, it's kind of hard to feel sorry for a guy who's played to throw and catch a ball. <laughs> but sometimes these players would say, hey, this is a lot, because ev almost every week there was a doubleheader. And they were doing the stuff on the road, and they were tired. On occasion, the, the manager would get somebody come up and says, listen, I'm really tired. I want to sit this game out. I want to take, can I have a day off? The manager would say, sure, I know how you feel. Take the day off, but do me a favor. You're in the starting lineup. Just play one in inning and then skip the rest of the game. <laughs> Well, invariably, what would happen is usually that player would get there in the game and he would get hooked and he would stay all the way to the end. Chapter 3 begins with an innocent meeting and ends with religious persecution and attempted murder. Interesting transformation it takes. Why? Because the person who's calling the shots doesn't have any values, doesn't have any understanding or belief system. Now, I'm saying this because it's actually in almost the system, the DNA of Babylonian leadership. If we jump to, to Daniel chapter 5, we're going to see something interesting in verse 23. Daniel 5, 23. It's Belshazzar comes after Nebuchadnezzar, and it's that pivotal moment when the kingdom is being transferred from one to the other, when the transfer, when, when the Babylonians lose power and the Medes and the Persians come in. Look at what we read in verse 23. Instead, this is God speaking, you have set yourself up against the Lord God of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praise the gods of silver, of gold, of bronze, and wood and stone, which you cannot see or hear or understand. Now what the scene is, is Belshazzar is having a party. He's having a party and they're enjoying themselves and they have forgotten, my friends, what is truly important what is truly important. And literally, right outside the gates are the Medes, and they are going to invade the, the, the city that very night. 
Now I got to thinking about this and I'm saying, what is it, Lord? What is going on here? I mean, you've, uh, Nebuchadnezzar Babylon has already taken over the, the, the Jerusalem. They've taken the cream of the crop from the city of Jerusalem. They have taken the artifacts from the city, of, uh, from the temple. And now it's like God is saying, you have, the, you have put the straw on the camel's back that's breaking it. You have taken the goblets from the temple and you have poured your pagan wine in it, and you and your concubines have drank it, and then you have saluted the gods of wood and silver and gold. And God is saying, I have put up with enough. I have put up enough, and I'm done. And that very night, you know what happens. Darius the Mede comes in, and without a single I would say bullet shot being fired, that, that the, the kingdom falls and is transferred. Now I'm thinking to myself, what if, what if Belshazzar had been a little bit more sensitive? Now this is, this is conjecture, this is hypothesis, this is theory. What if Belshazzar had said, you know what, we've got the goblets from, from the temple in Jerusalem, but we're going to leave them in there. We're going to respect that person's belief system. I have to wonder out loud if this story could have unfolded in a different way. Because it's like, it's like in, in Daniel 5, God is saying, all right, Belshazzar, enough is enough. You've taken this one step too far. You have insulted the God of eternity, the God of heaven, the God of the ages. And I am not going to put up with it anymore. And that night on the wall, you know the word, meany, meany, tekel, you parson. You have been weighed in the balances and been found wanting. I'm saying that, my friends, because today we find ourselves in a situation where what is up is down and what is down is up. What is wrong and what is right. Now, now, I know I'm stepping on toes here, but sometimes I need to have my toes stepped on. Sometimes we all need to have our toes stepped on, don't we? And, and, and let's go back to Daniel chapter 3. But what's going on here is, is they, they find themselves in this situation. And, and their, their, their party is going to be held or the assembly, and it's morphed into this worship service. Now, I've got to ask a question out loud. What does it really mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? What does it really mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Soren Kierkegaard, if you ever want to re- have your challenge, reading challenge and, and push it to the limit, you've got to read Kierkegaard. And, and I like what he says here. He says, it is well known that Christ consistently used the expression followers. He never asks for admirers worshipers or adherents no he calls disciples he calls disciples now i'm saying this because what's really at stake here is what do we consider worth my attention worth our worship worth our time our energy our talents and our treasure what is really worth it And Nebuchadnezzar finds himself setting up this image that they created themselves. They've made this. They've crafted it with their hands. And they said, worship this. Worship this. But that that image can do nothing for them. There is no symbiotic relationship. There's no give and take. There's no communication between the two. There's no love. Actress Sophia Loren had some of her jewelry stolen once. And she was so distraught about losing that jewelry, she began to cry. Movie director uh, Vittorio De Sia saw her crying and saw her complaining that her jewelry had been stolen. And he said these words. He said, listen to me, Sophia. I am much older than you, and there is one great truth I have learned about life. It is this. 
never cry over anything that can't cry over you. How true that is. And 600 years from this point in Daniel 3, God himself will do just that. He will show up and he will look at the city of Jerusalem and he will literally weep. He will look at that city and he will say, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Do you know what's going on? In Babylon, they didn't know. In Jesus' time, they didn't know. And my goodness, even in today, most people don't know. Now, i got to get really personal here, and i got to ask the question, what are our images? What are my idols? What are our idols? Well, like any good pastor, we go to Google. <laughs> Just for the fun of it, Google it, and one website, hit the, i got to say, hit the nail on the head. List six items. One of our idols is our identity. You know what he's saying right there, right? Our identity, our image. What do people think about me? Secondly, of course, is good old money materialism. Oh, we know about that one. Third one is entertainment. i got to ask a question. When was the last time any of us were ever bored and just stared out the window? You know, there is no such thing as boredom anymore. Sex, number four, comfort, number five, and number six is, of course, our phones. Our phones. One celebrity recently admitted to spending 16 hours a day on her phone. 16 hours. You may have heard of her name, Paris Hilton. 16 hours. Now, now, I know I'm meddling here, and sometimes we need to meddle. Sometimes I need to be meddled. Sometimes we all need to have these moments where we look into our hearts. And we've got to ask the question, what is the image of 2020? What is set up there in the plain of Dura? What is going on? Well, here's a scary verse in verse 7. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp and all kinds of music, all the nations and people of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. They fell for it. Hook, line, and sinker. They went for it. But you and I know this story. You, know, you and I know that it's not everybody because there's three or four heroes behind the scenes who have yet to come onto the, onto the stage. But before we get there, there's verse 8. Because in verse 8, it reminds us there's always somebody quick to catch on to our inconsistent behavior with other people and, or that's inconsistent with culture. And he says at this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. And then they appeal to Nebuchadnezzar's pride, and they say, Nebuchadnezzar, look, you're, you're a great man, you live forever, and didn't you declare these things? And then he says, well, listen, there's these guys, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They don't pay attention to you. They don't even serve your God. They don't worship your idol. And in verse three, it says, or 13, it says, furious with rage. Furious with rage. Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I had set up? And he gives them one more chance. But I want to propose to you this morning that in that chamber there were four, obviously four people, perhaps some guards, but there were four key players, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Nebuchadnezzar. I believe that the one who was the most afraid and the most scared was Nebuchadnezzar. I believe he was the one who was most threatened. I believe he was the scariest, the one who was the most scared. Erwin McManus, in a book called Uprising, puts it like this. When the fear of God is absent from our lives, we become slaves to lesser fear. 
How many times have you found yourself captive to the fear of rejection, the fear of failure? We've become a people bound and controlled by fear. Only the fear of God frees us from fear born out of superstition. What you fear is what you are subject to. Your fears define the boundary of your lives. I mean, let's face it, it's true. Oh, I'm never going to get that job. Why even apply? What just happened? You're not going to get the job. <laughs> I, you know, I want to get to know that person, yeah, so, but they're probably not going to like me. Well, guess what? You never get to know that person. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And our fears have defined who we are and who we are not. I mean, let's face it, it's just become part of our lives. We've got our car alarms, car locks, we've got our alarms on our houses, etc. The list goes on and on and on. Not far from here, my, my wife and I had a moment. We were walking around a, a, a campus of one of the prep schools. And it was really interesting. That it's a beautiful campus. And, and uh, we came there in the center of the campus was a very humble chapel. And you know what was interesting about that chapel? There was no lock on the door. It was literally unlocked. So me being nosy, us, we, we, we went inside, and it was a basic, basic chapel with a very, very primitive sound system, probably even had tubes in it. Probably just plug in and, you know, let it warm up, and then you're ready to go and unplug it when you leave. But it was interesting because there was no lock. It was unlocked literally all the time. Interesting perspective. That every time I and you have something of value, we have to invest our time protecting it, guarding it. Just like Sophia Loren. You've got this jewelry. Now your mind is diverted to that. And we find ourselves scatterbrained, literally, because of all the things that we have and the things that occupy our time. So I want to propose this morning that the issue in 2020 is not really fear, it is misguided fear. And maybe as we deal with our fears of 2020, we need to say, look, fear God, for that is the beginning of wisdom. And everything else will fall into place. Oh, there's a lot of fear going around, my friends. Injustice, the election, job loss relationship breaking up. All of these things are, are, are fears that are on people's minds, anxiety. And why is it that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego can go through this without seemingly sweating a bullet, all the while facing down this man named Nebuchadnezzar? I like what Peter Gomes says, power, success, happiness as the world knows them are his who will fight for them hard enough. But peace, love, and joy are only from God. Are only from God. Nebuchadnezzar was clueless about the peace, love, and joy Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego had. It was like a shark. Uh, can a shark appreciate the, the beautiful starry nights you, you, we see? No, it can't. It doesn't understand it. And that's the way it was for Nebuchadnezzar. He looked at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he says, what, you know, what is it with you guys? And they could see things that Nebuchadnezzar couldn't see. And we'll understand why in a moment, because it says here in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. The argument's done. We've thought this thing through, and we know something you don't. Have you ever heard the name Lana Peters? Lana Peters. Well, it was 1967, and she made a momentous trip from USSR to the United States, specifically to New York. And then she sought, she came to New York and sought political asylum. You see, her Russian name is Svetlana Aliluvi, and she had the ominous position of being Joseph Stalin's daughter. Now, Svetlana was being raised, and she was only being told the good things about her father. Then, slowly, her eyes were opened, 
and she saw what a monster her father was. And with a step of bravery, she found a way to seek political assignment, asylance in, in the United States of America. And as she got off the plane, she was undoubtedly interviewed, and her first sentence was, I found it impossible to exist without God in one's heart. I found it impossible to exist without God in one's heart. Because she knew that full and well that there was certainly a devil. <laughs> because she could see what her father was doing. There was ample proof of that. And she said, if there's a devil, there has got to be a God. There has got to be a God. She believed, I believe, moved to somewhere in the Midwest, Wisconsin, I believe it was, and died at the age of 85. She had some children, and there literally are some great-grandchildren or grandchildren of Joseph Stalin living around. Lena Peter said, I know what I believe. I know what I believe. And it says here in verse 17, you know, we just read this earlier, we, if we're thrown in the blazing furnace, God, who we serve, is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. He will do that. You know, it was only about an hour from here. A man went and hung around a pond called Walden Pond. You've heard about it, obviously. And he was around that pond, a pond and he wrote those words, two roads diverge in the wood, and I, I took the one less traveled, and that has made all the difference. We know it. But you know, there was another guy who hung around a different pond. It was more like a sea called the Sea of Galilee. And he gave a momentous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, and he said, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the, broad, and gate, wide is the gate and broad the road that leads to destruction, but seek to enter the narrow way, for that is the way of life. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego had found the narrow path. Even if that path went right into a fiery furnace. It was World War II was starting. The Germans, the Nazis had invaded Denmark. And this rattled everyone to the core. And the question was, what do we do in this situation? What do we do? And there was a man who was in charge of the church in Denmark, I believe probably the Lutheran church, Henrik. Heinrich uh, Kramer, he was a bishop. And the pastors went to him and he says, what should we do in this situation? What do we see? We do, we see it's unfolding before our eyes. And the pastor said, first, we must ask who we are. If we know who we are, then we will know what to do. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, knew who they were, and they knew what to do. And in verse 18, they say one of the most amazing Bible verses ever written. But if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. How in the world could these three men say such a thing? Because they knew who they were. They knew who they were. And because of that, and because they had encountered the God who valued them, they had value, and they had values. They knew that God had created them, that God loved them. And that gave them an identity and a purpose and a clear way of seeing life and navigating through life. Even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Do you know, well, sometimes some people call Christianity the crutch. Have you ever heard that? Christianity is a crutch. Well, my friends, I need a crutch. <laughs> I need a crutch. And I'm going to tell you, the fact of the matter is, research points over and over again that that crutch is a good crutch. In a journal... 
There was an article called Religion Replenishes Self-Control. An article. And what they did, they took some, some, some uh, people and they, they simply exposed them to religious words. That's it, religious words, terminology, perhaps confession, grace, strength, God's love. There was a whole list of them. And do you know what it did? Just that, just that alone gave them the ability to have more self-control. Just that alone. They gave them a distasteful drink to drink and, and they were able to tolerate more of it. They tested them on delayed gratification. They were able to hold out longer for a better reward. The point is, Shadrach, Meshach, and, then, and Abednego had that amazing perspective. <laughs> that amazing perspective that Nebuchadnezzar did not have. And in verse 19, it says here, then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. The other shoe drops. And now the apple, cup cut, the apple cart is upset. Martin Luther King Jr. punches me right in the middle of the eyes when he says the church, talking about years ago, was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. And I got to ask a question. Am I, are we, are we as a Christian uh, family, are we a thermometer or are we a thermostat? Are we amongst the thousands and thousands of people falling down and worshiping the image? Or are we the three guys in the hot seat? I hope and pray that I'm the guy in the hot seat. I hope all of us find ourselves in the hot seat, ready to stand up and face Nebuchadnezzar and his image. That we will be able to do that. Well, we know the story, my friends. And it's a favorite story of ours. We've been taught it since we were wee little. And they make the fire seven times hotter and there's collateral, collateral damage from that. And they're thrown in the fire and then something interesting happens. They're bound up, they're thrown in the fire, they're tossed in the fire, and you know what happens. Suddenly they're unbound. They're free. They are freer in the fire than they were outside of the fire. And then, and then... What happens is Nebuchadnezzar is watching this and he's looking into the fire and he sees one, two, three, how many? Four people in the fire. And he realizes, he looks closer, he says, that's got to be the Son of Man. That's got to be the Son of Man. And then one of the strangest things of Scripture happens. He tells him to come out of the fire and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do so. Now, i got to press the timeout button here for one moment. I'm going to tell you, to be honest with you. If I'm in a fire, and the shackles have come off, and I'm walking around in a fire <laughs> with God, you know what I'm going to tell Nebuchadnezzar? I'm sorry, I'm going to say, listen, if you want to talk with me, you come in here. I am not coming out there. I am walking with God right now. I'm with him. Listen, we got to negotiate this thing. You're, you're coming in here. But you know what happened? They answered the king's request and they walk out. And you know why I believe they could do that? Because I believe that they knew God walked out of the fire with them too. I almost wonder if Nebuchadnezzar, I'm sorry, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could see God when he couldn't see them. I don't know. One day I'm going to ask him. I'm going to ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what, 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 what all went down there? And they walked out of the fire. And what's interesting is that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't necessarily convert. He starts to say, listen, this God that the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego follow, he's valid. So nobody can defame them. Nobody can defame that God. Now, we know the story has a nice, sweet ending because in verse 20, 30 it says here, the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. They got a promotion. Well, my friends, they were, already sons and, they were already sons and daughters of God, weren't they? They had already been promoted in heaven. They were already there. So this meant really nothing to them. 
But I've got to wrap up with a, with a story that touches my heart and my wife's heart. It was years ago. Our son came home from school. My wife had picked him up from school, and my son was on a mission. And, and I, I'd never seen this before. And, and he was on a specific mission, and he got on the computer. He wouldn't say what he was doing, but he had to find the perfect, perfect picture. So he was looking on the Internet, and finally he found it. So you know how we do copy-paste, right? So copy-paste the picture. And then he wrote these words that I heard before, but since he, in his heart, wrote them, it means so much more. He wrote, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's the question, my friends, that's asked of me, that's asked of us. If we were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict me? Isn't it a beautiful thing when you can hear the voice of God? Amen. Sometimes we're not able to hear him because there's noise in our lives that can, you know, be a little bit louder. And we miss the words that God tries to speak to us. Um, but I pray that we can turn down the noise um, so we can hear when our Heavenly Father speaks to us, our dear, his dear children. Amen. I pray you are blessed by the words of the song.
Let us pray. Lord, we want to thank you. I want to thank you for the fact that this sanctuary is filled with Daniels, Shadrachs, Meshach, and Abednego's. Lord, I thank you in faith that that is truly what you see. Lord, as we leave here, I pray that we will always remember that. And whether we find ourselves facing the fire or in the fire, may we remember that you're with us and that, that what matters is that we fear you and that we pay our homage and our respect towards you and that, that, that you are the focal point of all that we do and the reason why we're alive and how we think and how we act and what we say. Oh, Lord, thank you again for the fact that you've promised that you will do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. I want to thank you, Lord, for the fact that you've given each of us faith. And we pray, Lord, as we go through the coming week, may we exercise that faith and may it grow And may we see us standing shoulder to shoulder with the four individuals in the book of Daniel. Please be with us as we go forth from here. May your spirit lead and guide us at all times. In the saving name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.